xong chơi anh coi cho please be seated Member of uh, the media are requested uh, to leave the, the room now, please, so that uh, we can commence our substantive hearing. Today, in the name of Cambodian people and the United Nations and pursuant to the law on the establishment of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia for the prosecution of crimes committed during the period of Democratic Pichir, promulgated by Royal Crum and SRKM 1004 006 dated on the 27th of October 2004, the trial chamber of the extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia declares open the substantive hearing on case file 001 relating to the accused Kang Kek Eo, alias Doj, aged 66, who has been charged with crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Convention of the 12th of August 1949, and violation of the 1956 Cambodian Penal Code, which consists of premeditated murder at the cause 501 and 506, and torture Article 500, offenses defined and punishable under Article 3 New, 5, 6, 29 New, and 39 New of the Law on the Establishment of the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia related to S21 in Phnom Penh. The bench is composed of judges, Nil Non, President, Silva Catright, three Judge Yasakon, four Judge Jean-Marc Lavigne, five Judge Tumani, and two reserve judges. One Judge Yu Otara, two Judge Claudia Fens. In this case file 001, there are 93 civil parties, all of whom have been divided into four groups, and also there are 15 civil parties lawyers in which six is national and nine is international. The greffier, have you already verified uh, the attendance and the identity of parties? this morning. Your Honours, the Grafier says, uh, I have already verified the attendance and the identity of uh, parties in the proceedings. Uh, the s five civil parties representative are absent. 
Today we have 44 civil parties at, in attendance. Thank you. The graph here makes sure that uh, these uh, attendance sheet uh, will be recorded in the transcript. The detention facility guard, uh, please uh, bring the child uh, person to the dock. Mr. Kang Gek Eo, please stand up. The next proceedings is relating to uh, the questions that uh, the chamber may ask uh, the accused to state identity. What is your name? My name is Kang Kek Eo, alias Doj. Could you please spell your name, Kek Eo? How is it spelled? In Latin, Kek Eo should be spelled as G O E K space E A W. Beside these names, uh, have you used uh, other names? The president, since I was born, my father gave me the name of Yun Chiu, and this name was given to me after three months when I was born, and uh, my name was registered. My my original name was Kang Chiu. Then later, there was a teacher who pretended to be a fortune teller gave me the name of Jim Kiu. And then I attended school, I used the name Kang Kiu. In 1957, uh, I uh, took the exam of the primary school exam, then I changed from Kang Kiu to Kang Gek Eo, as agreed uh, by my father. Then, when I came to uh, enter revolution, I used Kang Gek Eo, alias Deutsch, and Deutsch is uh, my revolutionary name at that time. In 1986, I went to China. I used the name Hong Pen. In China, I worked until 1988 and when, and I came back and I still use the name Hong Pen. Where were you born? Your honors, my real birthplace was in uh, Powai village, Pimbang commune, Stone district, Kampong Tom province. The President, what is your occupation? Uh, 
before you were arrested. Recently, before I was ar arrested by the military court, I was a teacher in some low district, Battambang province. What is your father's name? Is he still alive or deceased? Uh, the court official, could you please help uh, facilitate uh, the microphone for the accused? The president, your honors, my father's name is Kang Ki was born in 1915. Uh, he died in 1990. What is your uh, mother's name? Is, he, is she still alive or deceased? Uh, she was born in 1923. Now she is still alive. Uh, do you have any wife? Uh, what is her name and is she still alive or deceased? Do yes, I got a wife. I got married uh, on the 20th of December 1975, but she was deceased on the 11th of uh, November 1995. How many children have you got? The interpreter regrets uh, that uh, he cannot hear. The interpreter regrets that uh, he does not, we do not receive any sound from the accused. The second child is a boy. His name is Hong Siu Ping. He lives in some load and he works as a teacher. The third child is Hong Siu Ming, a boy, now lives in some load and works as a teacher. The fourth child, named Hong Tai An, lives in some load and is a teacher. Mr. Kang Kek Eeu, since you are the accused person in this case, during this hearing and uh, this sub, sorry, uh, or rather sequential hearings, you have the following rights. The rights to be defended uh, by a lawyer of your choice. Regarding this right, the chamber observes that uh, from the investigation phase up until now, you have two lawyers, one national, Mr. Ka Sawot, and one international, Mr. Frank Khwaru. At every stage of the proceeding, you have the right to remain silent, the right to uh, against uh, self-incrimination, the right to be informed of charges against you. Mr. Kang Kek Eeu, did you receive the notification of the charges against you? The, the president, I have already been notified of the charges against me. When did you receive that notification? Since I arrived at a, uh, the ECCC, the president, in addition to the notification of charges and in compliance with Rule 89B of the internal rules, the trial chamber assigns two graffiers, Ms. Sai Kolvati and Mr. Dutch Paris, 
to read the factual analysis in the indictment and the counts against you from the co-investigating judges. Closing order, paragraph 10 to 162, together with the pretrial chamber's decision on appeal against the closing order, paragraphs 152 to 153. The president would like to inform that, uh, sorry, the chamber would like to inform that the uh, names of uh, the people involved uh, uh, shall be used uh, with the pseudonym unless uh, there will be any protective measure issued. I would like to give the floor to Ms. Saikolvati uh, to read the, the first part of the factual analysis. ยงตามเลขาบัญชีเรื่องเตยจำนวนจำเรียจอดทั้งไงที่ปรับใบคายใส่หาชนะปีปอนปรับใบหรือบ้านกายปลายโดยสารเลขาระบอบอองโบเร
to the next phase of making socialist revolution. During the three years, eight months, and 20 days that followed, the CPK exercised effective authority over democratic Kampuchi and pursued a policy of completely disintegrating the economic and political structures of the Khmer republics and creating a new revolutionary state power. Historians and observers agree that this program was implemented through a number of means, including the forced transfer of residents of Phnom Penh and other former Khmer Republic strongholds to the countryside, the creation of party controlled agricultural production cooperatives where people were made to work under extremely difficult conditions to increase food production and the elimination of officials and supporters of the previous regime. Many of these CPK policies required the transformation of the new people into peasants. These individuals were broadly made up of evacuated city dwellers and peasants living under lunar control until April 1975, as distinct from the old or based people who were essentially peasants from areas already under the authority of the CPK during the Khmer Republic period. Politically motivated extrajudicial executions were committed from the outset of military units. They continued thereafter in security centers throughout the country. The CPK foreshadowed these events by organizing in February 1975 a popular national congress of the National United Front of Kampuchea, at which it publicly announced that seven so-called Khmer Republic super traitors were to be summarily killed for treason post-liberation. The congress also declared that lower level Khmer Republic personnel would be welcomed by the revolutionary forces, provided they immediately ceased their service to the seven traitors and stopped cooperating with them. This implied that any such personnel who did not immediately defect to the communist side were vulnerable to summary execution. In fact, it appears that from the early 1970s, CPK security organs such as M13, chaired by Dutch, had been tasked with executions indicating that a policy of physically eliminating persons deemed enemies of the revolution was already institutionalized prior to 17 April 1975. The CPK destroyed the legal and judicial structures of the Khmer Republic. While it is true that Democratic Kampuji adopted a constitution in January 1976, its Chapter 7 concerning justice showed the CPK's priority was to protect the state from subversion. Article 10 provided for an unspecified highest level of punitive sanction for opposition and wrecking activities of a systematic character that endanger the state, while declaring that other crimes must be dealt with through re-education and refashioning within the context of state or popular organs. Although Article 9 promised that courts constituted as people's courts belonging to the people would embody the people's justice and defend the people's rights and democratic freedoms. There is no evidence that they were ever created. Moreover, while the first and apparently only meeting of what was said to be popularly elected people's representative assembly mandated the formation of a judicial committee in April 1976, no evidence exists of any implementation of Article 9. This left the punishments set forth in Article 10 to be applied arbitrarily. Furthermore, there is no evidence that the CPK established appropriate facilities for captured enemy combatants or civilians or mechanisms to challenge the legality of their arrest, detention, or punishment. The old legal structures were replaced by re-education, interrogation, and security centers 
where former Khmer Republic officials and supporters, as well as others accused of offenses against the CPK, were detained and executed. This network of security centers were supplemented by a program of surveillance at all levels of the regime, which aimed to identify, report, and eliminate potential enemies of those in control of the party. Thus, numerous persons, rightly or wrongly linked to the Khmer Republic or its purported social class foundations, were punished or summarily executed by the CPK in the days and weeks immediately following the liberation of Phnom Penh through to the end of the regime. Almost immediately following the KPNLAF's entry into Phnom Penh on 17 April 1975, international armed conflict broke out between Vietnam and Cambodia. Protracted hostilities continued until at least 6 January 1979. Although the Democratic Kampuchi and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam only officially recognized the existence of international armed conflict on 31st December 1977, there is evidence that from mid-April 1975, with the exception of several respites during peace negotiations or diplomatic and cultural visits, there was escalating and increasingly frequent armed violence between the two states, in particular the former KPNLAF, renamed the Revolutionary Army of Kampuchea, RAK, fought the Vietnam People's Army at various times in the Cambodian territories of Ratanakiri, Mundulkiri, Kroche, Kampong Cham, Preveng, Swairing, Kondal, Takev, Kampot, and some islands including Pulawai, Koh Aise, Koh Tro, Koh Se, Koh Thmai, Koh Sampoj, Koh Rung, and Koh Muk Riem. At the end of 1977, the conflict escalated into a full-scale war which reached deep into the democratic Kampuchea and led to the decay to seize the United Nations Security Council of the matter on 31st December 1978. By 7 January 1979, the RAK had been forced to flee Phnom Penh, and from that point forward, the regime rapidly lost effective control of the greater part of Cambodian territory. It was against the backdrop of the creation of a radical new Cambodia and the war with Vietnam that S-21 was established. B. Establishment of S-21. On, August, on 15 August 1975, Sun Sen called Dutch to a meeting at the Phnom Penh train station together with B from Division 703 of the RAK. The purpose of the meeting was to plan the establishment of S21, which for the purpose of disclosing order includes the detention center and surrounding area, tools line, as well as its execution and re-education camp branches on the outskirts of Phnom Penh named Chiang Ai and Prey So, or S24, respectively. S21 was unique in the network of security centers given its direct link to the Central Committee and its role in the detention and execution of SPK cadre. Son Sen appointed B as chairman of S21 and committee secretary, with Dutch as his deputy in charge of the interrogation unit. Following the meeting, Dutch brought a number of his former M13 staff to Phnom Penh to join forces with the Division 703 personnel already conducting security operations against former Lunar Regime members in Phnom Penh. S21 became fully operational in October 1975. In March 1976, B was transferred to the General Staff and Dutch replaced him as chairman and secretary of S21. Dutch confirmed C 
a former Division 703 cadre, as his deputy responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the office. However, Dutch admitted he continued personally to oversee the interrogation of the most important prisoners and to be ultimately responsible for S-21. The third member of the S-21 committee and head of S-24 was D. Dutch stated that he was reluctant to accept his original appointment at S-21 and that he tried to apply for an assignment with the Ministry of Industry. He further stated that upon his promotion to Chairman and Secretary of S-21, he asked that the appointment be given to someone else. In any event, Dutch took command of S-21 and by his own admission understood, based on his experience at M-13, that he was capable of performing his work better than his predecessor. Under Dutch command, S-21 was divided into distinct units, each with its own function. The defense section was administered by C and his subordinate E. The interrogation section was directly overseen by Dutch and was generally managed by F and by G. H was responsible for maintaining the document unit and he reported to Dutch through C. I was the head of the special unit which had a number of duties. It received those sent to S21, brought them to the chairman of the defense unit, intervened in emergencies and carried out executions. There were also a number of other units which included photography, medicine, cooking and logistics. Dutch ran S21 along hierarchical lines and established reporting systems at all levels to ensure that his orders were carried out immediately and precisely. Several witnesses said Dutch was feared by everyone at S21. He enforced both the general rules of the party in relation to the work of the secret security police as well as strict rules which he devised for the operation of S21. Dutch selected his staff personally. Initially, from amongst his most trusted subordinates at M13, and later by recruiting children and adolescents as guards, who, he said, were like a blank piece of paper and could be easily indoctrinated. The original S21 complex was located in Phnom Penh in Bang Kheng Kong 3 sub-district, Jamkamon district. The detention and interrogation facilities were originally located in a block of houses on the corner of streets 163 and 360. In late November 1975, S21 moved to the National Police Headquarters on Street 51, Rue Pasteur, near Central Market, Sat Mai. Yet, in January 1976, it moved back to its original location. Finally, in April 1976, upon Dutch decision, the prisoners were moved to the premises of the Punyi Yad Lycée, a high school located between streets 113, 131, 320, and 350. S21 operated at this location, which is now the site of the Tours Line Genocide Museum, until 6 January 1979. The central building, referred to as Building E, was used to receive, register, and photograph prisoners, and a room was devoted to creating paintings and sculptures that glorified the regime. Four other buildings, A, B, C, and D, were used for detention. Buildings B, C, and D held the general prisoner population in a mixture of large mass detention cells and small brick or wooden individual detention cells. Building A, together with a block of houses located south of the former lycée called the Special Prison, housed important prisoners. The former school and the Special Prisons were the heart of the most secure and secret part of the S21 complex. They were surrounded by fences and the interior and exteriors were protected by armed guards. Many other buildings from the surrounding neighborhood were also part of S21. 
These including interrogation houses, execution sites and mass graves, mess halls, a medical center, houses for the staff, various offices and houses for Dutch, and a house for the reception of prisoners. These buildings were all situated within a second outer perimeter that was also protected by armed guards. Initially, prisoners were executed and buried in and around the S-21 complex. At some time between 1976 and mid-1977, partly in order to avoid the risk of epidemic, Dutch decided to relocate the execution sites to Chiang Ai, located approximately 15 kilometers southwest of Phnom Penh in Kondal province, and now the site of a memorial. The execution site consisted of a wooden house where prisoners were held until just before the execution and a large area that consisted of pits for executions. However, even after Chiang Ai became the main killing site, certain executions and burials took place at or near S21. Dutch recognized that S24 was part of S21. In principle, S24 was tasked with reforming and re-educating combatants and farming rights to supply Office S21 and its branches. It was located outside of Phnom Penh near the execution site of Chiang Ai in the area of Wat Kadol in the Dong Kao district of Kondal province. Although witnesses state that the main structures and activities extended from the place of prison to Jade Village, it appears the total area of S24 was larger. C. Implementation of CPK policy at S21. A. 1. The policy of smashing enemies. The primary role of S21 was to implement the party policy to mean kill. Every prisoner who arrived at S21 was destined for execution. Although one witness claimed he was able to leave S21, the vast majority of evidence demonstrates that the policy at S21 was that no prisoner could be released. This is confirmed by testimony that prisoners brought to S21 by mistake were executed in order to ensure secrecy and security. Dutch also claimed he tried to release prisoners on several occasions, but was unsuccessful. Moreover, other prisoners pleaded with Dutch for their lives or wrote letters through him to senior leaders, but to no avail. The CPK governed Democratic Kampuchea primarily through DK state organizations, CPK administrative bodies, and the RAK. The 1976 Constitution of Democratic Kampuchea and the party's own statutes gave the CPK Central Committee wide powers, including the ability to formulate party-wide policy and the authority to issue orders to subordinate zones and sectors. In practice, however, a subcommittee of the Central Committee, known as the Standing Committee, acted as the highest and most authoritative unit in decay. A standing committee decision from 9 October 1975 gave Pol Pot general responsibility over the military and Son Sen responsibility for the general staff and security. Dutch has repeatedly portrayed S21 as an integral part of the political military structure of the CPK at the center level, referred to variously by Dutch Air Onka, the organization, the party center, the central committee, or the standing committee. Dutch indicated that, as with all CPK political lines, the policy of smashing enemies was global. It stood for S21, for the entire party, the military, the state authority in the bases, and the police offices throughout the country. Dutch stated that specific decisions concerning the persons to be sent to S21 were made by his superiors, while the exact role of his superiors is currently the subject of a separate judicial investigation which has declared that S21 was run directly by the Central Committee. 
Dutch specified, however, that he primarily deals directly with Sun Sen and Che, both of whom he believed to be acting on behalf of the Standing Committee. Although the policy of smashing enemies appears to have remained in force both before and throughout the temporal jurisdiction of the ECCC, the definition of those perceived to be enemies of the CPK evolved and broadened over the period as a result of domestic developments and the international armed conflict between Cambodia and Vietnam. Thus, from late 1975 and into 1976, S21 was significantly involved in the imprisonment, re-education, torture, and execution of persons linked to the ousted Khmer Republic regime. However, by the time Dutch became chairman of S21, the party had clarified authorities to execute at different levels within the regime and increasingly sent members of the revolutionary ranks to S21. A document dated 30 March 1976 and attributed to the CPK Central Committee reported a number of decisions, the first of which provided that in order that there is a framework in absolute implementation of our revolution and to strengthen our socialist democracy, the right to decide on smashing within and outside the ranks was to be bestowed as follows. If in the base framework to be decided by the zone standing committee surrounding the center office, to be decided by the Central Office Committee, independent sectors to be decided by the Standing Committee, the Central Military to be decided by the General Staff. So in this text by the co-investigating judges, Dutch commented that it was a historical document. It shows a turning point because it reveals the beginning of internal purges. Before that, mainly officials of the old regime were smashed from that point, executions would take place mainly within the party. Dutch adds that in 1976, Pol Pot had eliminated the exploiting classes, private property, officials of the former regime, religions, and teaching. Teachers were sent to rice fields. The decision of 30 March 1976 began a new period, during which the internal purges were predominant. In the following months, internal CPK documents would be filled with variations on the theme of a need for heightened revolutionary vigilance with a view to ensuring that the enemy is unable to bow from within the party and the army. Dutch recognized that his role as chairman of S21 was to focus the office on the smashing purported traitors within the ranks of the revo revolution itself. In this regard, Dutch said, initially, S21 was just for important prisoners or those from Phnom Penh, as well as members of the Central Committee. At first, low-ranking combatants only came to S21 if arrested in Phnom Penh. As a general rule, high-ranking enemies inside the party, state, military, or security apparatuses were sent to S21, having been implicated via a process which consisted of obtaining confessions from others previously arrested. When a superior was arrested, such as K, Minister of Commerce and member of the Senatorial Committee, his or her subordinates would, in turn, often be sent to S21. Moreover, Dutch recognized that the policy of smashing enemies almost always extended to their families, including children. Dutch further recognized that, subsequently, when the repression intensified, S21 also received people from the countryside. I also witnessed massive arrivals of prisoners from certain zones. For instance, when the head of the West Zone Security Office, L, was arrested, I saw many people arriving from that zone. These arrests preceded the arrest of L's superior, M. This was an implementation of Ho Chi Minh's doctrine. Before cutting the bamboo, one must trim the thorns, likewise for the northwest zone. 
This pattern is corroborated by prisoner lists that demonstrate clearly that by January 1979, S21 had detained persons from nearly every zone, every ministry, and every military unit in the nation. The role of S21 further extended to executing those in the revolutionary ranks who were accused of being influenced by or under the control of Vietnam due to their former or contemporaneous associations with the Vietnamese Communist Party. This rationale for arrest appears to have increased in direct correlation with the escalation of the international armed conflict. Similarly, as the conflict intensified, the numbers of Vietnamese civilians and soldiers arrested and sent to S-21 also grew. Two, dissemination of policy at S-21. The political line of the CPK was disseminated at S-21. Dutch and other S-21 cadre attended general political education and agricultural production planning meetings convened under the auspices of the center general staff. Dutch and other former S-21 cadre stated that they also attended training sessions convened by Son Sen to discuss the need to purge and smash enemies. Former S-21 personnel agreed that the policy of extrajudicial execution was widely disseminated throughout S-21 at annual meetings of the entire unit, as well as at smaller meetings of its various sub-units. Dutch and other CPK members and youth leaked members at S-21 were also made aware of the role of their office in implementing these policies through the party journals revolutionary flag and revolutionary youth. Allegations of treason to which S-21 prisoners had been compelled to confess were presented as fact in these publications and alluded to in official DK propaganda. Alleged traitors such as N, O, P, and K were repeatedly referred to by name. According to Dutch, extracts from tape recorded S-21 confessions or written text were played or read out at meetings outside of S-21 to justify the actions of the regime. Dutch conceded that from the time he became S-21 chairman, specific instructions to and from S-21 regarding security matters were conveyed exclusively through him. Former S-21 personnel confirmed that Dutch acted to further disseminate this line within the unit. In an S-21 interrogator's notebook, a statement attributed to Dutch noted that the work of S-21 is a task of class struggle. That is, it is aimed at smashing the oppressor class, digging out their trunk and roots to defend the party, defend the proletariat class, defend the democratic Campuchia, and defend the line of independence and mastery. The notebooks of Dutch assistant, the interrogator F, seem to further corroborate Dutch contention that his detailed training of S-21 staff was based on instructions from the superiors. Three, the use of S-21 confession authenticated by Dutch revealed the extent to which S-21 played an active part in the process of attacking and eliminating enemies boring from within. In addition to executing prisoners condemned in advance as traitors, an overriding purpose of S-21 was to extract confessions from prisoners in order to uncover further networks of possible traitors, which stated that the content of the confession was the most important work of S-21. Confessions seem typically to have taken the form of political autobiographies by the prisoners in which they were compelled to denounce themselves and others as treacherously serving the intelligence agencies of foreign powers considered to be enemies of the Cambodian Revolution. 
Those intelligence agencies included the United States CIA, the Soviet KGB, the organs of the Vietnamese Communist Party. These confessions, some many hundreds of pages long, contain detailed descriptions not simply of alleged treacherous activities, but also the structure and operation of all levels of the party and of all administrative units, which meticulously read, analyzed, and annotated and summarized the majority of these confessions for his superiors. He was therefore in a unique position to understand the DK-wide context of the CPK policies applied at S21. Deutsch said that the role of S21 was not to determine whether detainees were traitors as the guilt was already established by the fact that they had been arrested and sent to S21. It was their confessions which served the political interest of those in control of the party by justifying arrest and implicating the networks of those sent to S21. Dutch now maintains that he was, from an early time, skeptical of the veracity of the confessions, claiming that they were demanded from above. He explained that the contents of the confessions were used as excuses to eliminate those who represented obstacles, adding that even the standing committee, in my opinion, did not really believe in it. He also recognized that the operations of S21 were obviously not compatible with the existence of tribunals and procedural safeguards. Deutsch stated that in many cases, he was given instructions concerning the extraction and content of specific confessions. In particular, he asserted that at the instigation of his superiors, the words CIA and KGB were initially used by the interrogators themselves regardless of whether they contained fault, false or fabricated assertions, the confessions are said by Deutsch to have been given formal weight in deciding upon the arrest of those denounced as enemy agents. He explained that normally implication in one confession was not sufficient for a person to be arrested. It had to occur several times. Confessions obtained from one person often led to the arrest of many others they implicated as traitors. It also appears that names from different confessions were combined to form list of enemies. Evidence of confessions annotated by Deutsch support his contention that they were forwarded to high-ranking party members. D. Functioning of S21 the following sections described and analyzed the acts committed on a day-to-day -day basis at Tua Slay, Preso, and Chiang Ai by Dutch and his subordinates in furtherance of CPK policy. They set out the general manner in which detainees were processed at S21 from arrest and detention through to interrogation and ultimately execution. 1. Arrest and detention. A. Composition of the detainee population. Surviving documents have clarified the number and identity of detainees held at S21. Much of this evidence was compiled by the OCP by combining the prisoners' list and execution logs to form a single master list of S21 prisoners named the combined S21 prisoner list. This list indicates that at least 12,380 men, women, and children were detained at Dual Slang. This compilation is not exhaustive as some prisoners were not registered and some records have no doubt been lost. This fact is supported by Deutsch, who identified a number of detainees whose names are missing from the compilation. The prisoners were predominantly Cambodian. The largest group was composed of cadre, 
workers and combatants, as well as their relatives who came from virtually every office and unit in the country and from all existing zones and autonomous sectors. The list provides an approximate overview which shows that more than 5,000 prisoners came from DK government offices and over 4,500 came from DK military units. DK cadre represented by far the largest group and included a number of members of the Central and Standing Committee.